really amazing, you know, what's in the video, what's to come with the company. I'm sure there, you know, it's a hugely ambitious project. I'm sure there are people who told you, don't do that, do something else. So what is Stoke and why are you doing this thing? Great question. Um, so from the video you saw, we do fully rapidly reusable rockets. Um, we're a completely vertically integrated company from design, conception, to manufacturing virtually everything in the rocket, our own launch complex, and then um, through to launch. So our actual product is a launch service. We build fully rapidly reusable rockets in order to provide that launch service at the lowest cost, the best availability, and the best reliability on the market. Um, I would say that I got into space because I love it and I've stayed in space because I really think that it is one of the major pillars that we as a civilization will use to continue to scale in a way that's also sustainable. Um, and that's true for not only on ground but also in space. So I, I really feel high conviction in that. Um, I got into a, uh, I guess, a, a junction point in my career trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I found myself looking for a team who was building the right thesis with the right team and laying down a pattern of what I call habitual execution. Um, I found it very hard to find any one of those three things. And so it became my mission to build a company that's delivering all of those three things. And uh, that's what we're all about. Um, it's just been a real pleasure to like, actually go out to um, the facilities, go out to Moses Lake, see how things are being built. And it, for me, I've just learned a lot. Um, you're building something that's very big and ambitious physically, but um, what I've learned are some real, I think, important lessons about what goes into how do you, how do you build a company the right way? And it's tangible and it's, uh, it's more obvious in the context of building physical things. So maybe if you could just talk a little bit about some of your, your guiding principles of what goes into building a company. How do you start from really literally in like a backyard or a, 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 a I think a garage or a, a, yeah, both of those. a shipping garage container and backyard, yeah. and, you know, to where you are? Yeah, we got our start, um, you know, in a basement as any good startup does. And, um, but we, we had no idea how to raise money or you know we didn't we didn't go into this with an existing rolodex and so um, we, we kind of worked for a while and tried to figure out do we have an idea that is executable and can deliver on this thesis and so we worked hard on that question and we felt like we had a good idea um we were like we were trying to figure out what do we do next how do we raise money and uh, this was in you know the early 2020 right as covid was hitting and the markets were crashing and, and all these things um, but we, we did have one good conviction, and that was that um, if we start building, then um, you know, that will be a good differentiator. We didn't want to be another PowerPoint company. We wanted to show that you know, we're real, we can do this, and, uh, and, and use that in fundraising. So yeah, it started in the backyard, in the garage. We started building hardware. Our first little test facility, which we still have, um, was a shipping container in, in my co-founder's yard. Pretty fun. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, though, I think you know how do you build and scale a company from that to um, you know ultimately where we want to get, which is much bigger than where we are today. Um, I guess for reference, we're we're about 230 people right now. I think you know there's certain things that you have to be aware of. You have to have, um, be very deliberate and intentional about the culture that you're building, the people you're bringing on. Um, how those interactions will go. You have to continuously course correct along the way. Um, and I think you have to be very intentional about who you are and how you're organized at each scale of the company. So when you're, let's say, zero to 20 people, that's a different organizational model than when you're 100 people or uh, you know, around 250 people, things start to break down again. Um, and so you have to be very intentional about who you are as a company, at what stage, how you're organized, um, be thinking ahead so that you can transition from one mode into another kind of seamlessly, people might not even notice. Um, yeah, but, but very, very deliberate about the culture that you're building. It also seems like there's something very deliberate about the way you, you're building the company in the sense that you're doing everything. I think there may be a nut or a screw that you buy from somewhere else, but I think everything, you know, down to the software, the avionics, everything is in-house. And 
I, I suspect some of that's out of necessity because you didn't have the luxury of a lot of capital on the front end. But um, maybe talk through that decision about what to do by yourself and what to have others do. Well, look, if there are things that are commoditized and available with no lead time and are you know, good mature products, then probably the right answer is to build them. In the space industry, very few of those things exist because there's just not a lot of volume out there. There are some things. For example, solenoid valves are you know, sold to every Falcon 9, and so there's a ton of them, and you know, we can use them, and they're qualified for the environments, et cetera. Um, but for most other things, that, that supply chain doesn't exist. Uh, and, and I think that, in, really, this goes for any hardware or hard tech business. The name of the game is how fast can you build and iterate and go through your R&D phase in order to enter market. And so from that perspective, the thing that matters most is controlling your dependencies. And the way you control your dependencies the best is to do it yourself. Um, because you know what the highest priority is. You are always your own highest priority if you're outsourcing things, especially in R&D when, you know, volumes, you're going to order things from machine shops or from whatever supplier. Your volumes are low. You're not going to be, especially with a startup too, you're not going to be a powerful customer for most suppliers. And so you are the bottom priority. Um, you, need to, you need that to be the top priority, and that's why to vertically integrate. So we have the ability to build and make almost everything on the rocket. That doesn't mean we do. We'll do, you know, we'll send things out when the timeline is more predictable or less critical, um, you know, when we're making something at some level of rate. But for uh, the ability to get to the test stand, break something, learn how, learn how it works, and then make adjustments, you have to own that. Um, maybe a little bit on, on hiring people. So, um, Two of the most exciting parts of the, the field trips that I've taken, one was to the weld shop, and the other was out in uh, Moses Lake, and getting a tour of how the um, the wiring harnesses and wiring was being put together for the for the test stands, and in both cases, the people leading that were just massively passionate about hacking something, like buying something from Amazon to do a seam welder, or making sure that like, every single wire was you know, perfectly aligned. Didn't have to be, but how do, you, how do you hire for those people, especially at the very beginning of the formation of a company? I think, first of all, the type of people you are looking for, have to, they're different at different stages of the company. And so at the very beginning, um, I would say drawing from your internal network is a great strategy because you know the best of the best of the people that you've ever met, right, in this, in this industry or whatever you're trying to do. In the early days, you need people who are able to think at a strategic high level as well as dive all the way into the weeds on a number of different fronts and be kind of a jack of all trades and be able to do a lot of things. So these are very unique kind of a people, people that you're looking for. Um, and then if you add on top, layer on top of that, bring the right attitude, um, be respectful. We're not trying to, you know, be a culture where we're yelling and screaming at each other and grinding people out every two to three years, right? They have to kind of check all those boxes. And those early, early people are so important because if you don't get those right, then they'll per perpetuate a culture that is not what you're looking to build. Uh, so those people are really, really important. Um, and, uh, you know, we got lucky to, to bring on the people. Yeah, that we did. No, they're super excited about what the, yeah. the work is. And you is. haven't been to Cape Canaveral yet, but when, you, not, when but you go, that team's a yeah. whole nother, another uh, A-plus team. It's really I'd incredible. love to talk about um, a topic that's probably not the most fun part of, of building a rocket company, which is raising capital to do it. And it's a process. And maybe just talk through a little bit about kind of the phases and is there this valley of death in terms of capital raising and what is it that defines that, where are you, and how do you get across from less capital being less risky to less capital being more risky? Well, um, first thing, this is my first startup, and like I said at the beginning, we didn't have the Rolodex to, to go and lean on and, and try to pull capital quickly. And uh, when we went out to raise, it was in the thick of COVID, and, and you know the sky was falling, nobody knew what was going on. And most people that we talked to, you know, were focused on their portfolio to try to keep them alive and, and whatnot. So 
Uh, it was a very hard in environment. I would say that uh, in general, we have terrible timing <laughs> with the market <laughs> because that's when we raised, we tried to raise our seed. Um, 21 was a pretty good year, and then we did additional raises in 23 and 24, which are very hard markets for hard tech growth. Um, so it's been a struggle, but I think it's been a healthy struggle because it's certainly hardened me. It's made sure that we are very focused on what we're doing. Uh, we're focused on execution, um, and you know, so far we've made it. Um, Can I interrupt? Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a there's a part of a, so from an LP seat. We don't usually see the insides of the, the machine so much, but every once in a while we get to, to see it. You know, Mac, um, as Adrian was saying, yeah. it was a, it's an easy decision in some sense. So here's, here's a vision for the future, here's a founder yeah. that references well where there's high conviction on those dimensions, very easy. Um, for us, it was easy. We had three separate um, reference points that allowed us to get conviction. But I've been astonished at the, I'll just call it gutlessness, or the cowardice of venture capitalists in general um, in funding something that has all these elements in place where there's execution that is almost flawless to say, not quite yet. So yeah. what, what, do you, what do you make of that? Well, first of all, um this is one of the reasons I love Mac and um, you know our company probably wouldn't be here without them. Uh, because again, we were raising in this very hard environment. It's a big vision. It's extremely capitally intensive. Um, I think the upside is enormous as well, but there's a long road to go. And, and by no means were we the first people to the, the starting line. Um, and so, you know, we had gone through what was a very challenging, you know, for me personally, we're trying to get this thing off the ground and you're just hearing no after no after no. And then we talked to Mac and Mac seemed to, you know, st at least entertain the discussion for a while. And then all of a sudden Mike Plank calls up and he has a, asks a question about, um, he found in a textbook on rocket engines, he asked a question about XYZ from Sutton. I was like, this guy's from the entertainment industry reading Sutton. Now we're, now we're getting somewhere. This is amazing. Um, and, they, and they came in. So um, first of all, I, that's one of the things I love about Mac is that they're thinking from first principles um, and, and willing to make the bet that you know, maybe not everybody else is jumping in on. And, and that was a catalyst, catalyst moment for us. Um, the other thing that I would feel or, or say is that I do think the valley of death for hardware companies is real. I think, um, I think that there's a good seed and even series A type of ecosystem where people are willing to take risk on big ideas and go. Um, but after that, they hand off to the growth funds and the growth funds wanna see revenue, they wanna see scale, they wanna see products in market. And for a lot of hardware companies, it just takes longer and it takes more capital to get there. And so there's this gap between those seed and A uh, com uh, venture companies and, and the growth funds, and that's real. It's very difficult to find, especially in hard markets, it's difficult to find people who are willing to you know, take a growth-sized bet on something that's still pre-market. I think that hole is real. Yeah, I think there's really, there is this gap. It's, a, it's an inefficiency in the market. I hope it gets resolved because it, it, the market in general would function better. Um, I know well, well, let me, let me yeah, pile yeah, onto yeah. there. Just, I think it's a very important gap to fill and I also think it's a very important time to fill that gap. And one of the reasons is because AI is everywhere and it's making um, any software idea, this is maybe oversimplification, but allow me to generalize. A software idea is getting much cheaper to bring to market because of AI. There's almost, there's a, it's very hard to establish a software moat now because of AI. In hardware, it's, it's a very different story. Hardware has intrinsically different moats. And I think the value of the human is going to revert back to physical applications, which means physical hardware companies more valuable in, in the future. And, um, and that gap is real though, right? So we have to figure out how to bridge that. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, one more. Um, just on this, the, you know, the importance of hardware and, and the, the, the thing you're working on. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about kind of the lay of the land right now. Elon Musk is sort of up and down, you know, maybe a competitor, maybe not. You have this NSSL um, 
you know, um, approval. Uh, what, you know, just as quickly as you can, what's the lay of the land and, yeah. and what, what does it look like from where you sit? Well, there's several layers on this that I think are important. I'll try to go re really, really fast. But first of all, you know, if you zoom way out, um, in the macro sense, there's very real geopolitical tension happening between us, the Western world or the free world, and um, just to be explicit with China. There's a kind of a silent proxy war happening in space right now. It is the upper ground. It is what all of our joint forces kind of rely on for logistics and whatnot. And so it's very important that if you value, regardless of current administration, regardless of politics, if you value the values of a free world and, and capitalist competitive markets, it is very important that we invest in space and we come out on top uh, in, in this political tension. Within the last couple of weeks, it's been a very interesting time in, uh, in you know, the U.S. And, and in space. And I think I will just say that it highlights the importance of having more than one option to deliver assets, including especially our national security assets, to space rather than being beholden on one company or one individual. I'll just leave it at that. Yep, and Stoke's going to do it. So. And that's what we want to do. Right. Yeah.